Welcome. In this video, we will share five tools in guiding behavior. Lots of visuals and conclude with a little tune. So let's begin. I'm teacher Mary Ellen. I'm your presenter today. Here at the Children's Center, we follow and practice the guides to speech and action developed by Katherine Reed Baker. These guides are overviewed by another staff member during this training video. In addition to these guides, we also practice the following in our interaction with and support of young children in their development. To assist us in our learning today, we will be using a bag of five tools. The first tool is active listening. Active listening is when you put on your big ears and eyes and listen to what the child is really trying to tell you. We listen reflectively to children's feelings, needs, and wants, often mirroring them. We try to reflect upon what we are observing without labeling. When children are experiencing or demonstrating strong feelings, work to identify in your mind what the child might be feeling. Approach the child by mirroring what he or she might be feeling. For example, you could say, I see you are crying. You might be sad. Looks like you might want your turn right now. There might be a problem here. Or you might hear, I hate you. And you could address it as, gee, those are really strong words. Avoid saying, I know how you feel. You must be feeling angry. Especially avoid the temptation to give little lessons in your guidance like, that's not nice. You're angry, but it's not nice to spit. Be a good girl and share. Or be a big boy. You don't need to cry anymore. So remember, what you want to do is practice active listening and mirror what you see and hear. Our second tool is modeling. Another way we guide behavior is to model behavior we want ch children to learn. We teach best by example. Let's use modeling clay to demonstrate. When you greet children and families and other staff members by name, children will want to do the same. When you blow your own nose and wash your hands afterwards, children will watch you to do so. When you sing at circle time, children will more likely to participate. When you try all the food on your plate, children might try something new too. And when you sit in a chair and not on the table, children are more likely to follow your example. Children will follow your lead during cleanup. And if you offer a hug to a hurt child, other children will see you do so. When you use please and thank you, children will want to as well. Remember, children are very watchful and observant, so be careful of what you say and do. When children see you yelling across the environment, they might do so to get a peer to comply with their requests. When you chew gum at school, children will ask you to do so as well. And if you run in the halls, so will the children. When you kick off your shoes and drop your coat, children will do so too. Generally, when we practice these guides, children are developmentally responsive in their behavior with the adults and peers who surround them. A third tool is the physical environment. How can the environment promote positive and safe behavior? What can we add so that adults do not have to constantly state the rules or limits to children? For example, are there enough materials for children to use? Is the direction that we want children to go while riding their tricycles visually represented? How about adding a child-sized broom and dustpan near the sensory tables so that the children can assist in cleaning up spilt sand, flour, or rice? Are there visual signs for everyday routines and regular expectations for children. For example, are there hand washing and nose blowing signs? Showing children what we expect. 
is there a walking sign in the hallway reminding children not to run? Other questions to consider when looking at the physical environment would be, what might be removed from the environment so that the adults are not constantly correcting children? For example, are the amount of toys and materials in the environment appropriate to the developmental level of the children? Meaning, are there too many materials for children to realistically pick up and put away before moving on to something else? Or do we need to add more toys and materials to the environment? In summary, it's often true that adding or removing materials, changing the environment, will provide for change in children's behavior and optimum learning and developmental opportunities. The fourth tool is consequences. Support children in experiencing natural and logical consequences for their behavior. The goal of this is for children to see the logic of what happens next. When you do this, this happens next. To use the valuable principle of cause and effect or natural or logical consequences, the adult often needs to think about what might happen next and ask himself, what is the consequence of this behavior? Sometimes the adult might need to arrange the experience so that the child sees the logic of what happens next. It's the important for the adult to guide the child through the process and not lay it out verbally and expect them to just do it. It is also important for adults to remember that when guiding children to accept logical consequences, the children are experiencing a learning process. So the likelihood of a child again experiencing the same cause and effect behavior may occur within the same hour, so be ready. Some examples of natural or logical consequences are the following. A positive consequence of a child sharing his sand toys, blocks, or dolls with a peer might be that the child has a friend and is developing positive social-emotional skills. Adults can point this out. When a child spills his cereal or sand on the floor, a teacher can help the child use a broom and dustpan to clean up. When a child is demonstrating frustration with trying to pull a wagon through the sand, guide the child to an area where the wagon can be pulled. This would be a great opportunity to support the child in problem solving and developing solutions. A teacher might say, it looks like it's difficult for you to move the wheels when they are stuck in the sand. Is there a place you can think where they might roll easier? So let's remember that some consequences are beyond the child's developmental ability to understand, like breaking a drum head by pounding on it with a stick instead of using his hands, or riding the tricycle into something without noticing the damage. It's hard for children to recognize the wear and tear or safety issues related to this behavior, and this will be your job to step in and give simple explanations, not moralizing, to redirect the behavior, always involving the child in the process of coming up with alternatives. So in conclusion, let's remember to use the five tools in our guiding children's behavior bag. We have active listening, modeling, consequences, the physical environment, and problem solving. So now we have a little tune to help you remember the five tools for guiding children's behavior. A for active listening, M for modeling, and P for the physical environment. Consider adding or taking away C for consequences that are natural or logical, and PS for problem solving. This is how the tune goes.
A M P C P S problem solving tools. Use your tools. Use your tools. Remember, children learn every day. A M P C P S problem solving tools. Yay!